This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the stone was Mazarin, the carbuncle was blue, and the mane was lion, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about what kind of chemistry experiments Sherlock Holmes was running? Or what a Yegman is? Or why Holmes' index was sorted haphazardly? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Walder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 177, Billy the Page. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the itty-bitty details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder, the paragraph. <laughs> just not the whole page, just the paragraph. Well, yeah. if, if you wanted to be, uh, technically, if you wanted to be the whole page, wouldn't it be William the page and Billy the paragraph? Oh, uh, that's, that's a good idea. That's, yeah, that's, I hadn't thought about that. That's too much thinking this time around. Well, if you would like to leave us a message, whether it's a paragraph or a whole page, we would love to hear from you. You can reach us at trifles at IHearOfSherlock.com if you are the kind that sends emails. If you would like to leave us a comment on this episode, you can find it at iHose.co slash trifles177. And, of course, you can hit us up on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, we are I Hear of Sherlock in all of those places. And, of course, tell your friends about the show. It would be great if you shared this episode with one person. Think of one person right now who you think could benefit from this show and share it with them. And that would help other people discover what it is that you already know, which is that you enjoy yourself here. And we enjoy having you here. Yeah. Well, this is the episode of the month where we talk about an old piece of Sherlockian scholarship, something that has withstood the test of time and has uh, made its way through publications. And this one, you know, this is interesting because this is the first time we're taking something from the Sherlock Holmes Journal. This, of course, is the official publication of the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. And you can join the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. It is a membership organization. And what you get as part of your membership is a subscription to the Sherlock Holmes Journal. And one of the publications that they came out with was the best of the Sherlock Holmes Journal. Uh, there so far have been two volumes. And we looked into volume one, which was published in 2006, and found a piece called Billy the Page by G.B. Newton, and this originally appeared in Volume 2, Number 3, of the Sherlock Holmes Journal. And in it, Mr. Newton uh, wishes to identify exactly who Billy was and, and where page boys were uh, mentioned in the Sherlock Holmes canon, and to definitively identify Billy's term of service at 221B. Baker Street. And he narrows this down to 1900 to 1903. So we want to look into this a little bit and see if, if Newton was actually correct in his theories and if we can poke any holes in them along the way. Hmm. So where do we encounter Billy, the page boy, by name in the canon? Well, according to Newton's paper, I must admit I haven't independently verified this, but I trust the Sherlock Holmes Society of London has done it. Billy, there are there are boys and page boys and boys and buttons that pop in and out of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Typically, when there's something 
manual to be done, you know, go dispatch these telegrams, go do this, go do that. Um, but Billy is only found, says Newton, by name in three stories, in The Valley of Fear, The Problem of Thor Bridge, and The Mazarin Stone. That is that is correct. Now, the the trouble here is that when you think about the Mazarin Stone and the Valley and and the Thor Bridge, those were cases that ostensibly took place a little later uh, in the 1900-1903 range. However, the Valley of Fear, even though it was a later, it was the last of the novels to appear. Um, this was. This was pre-Reichenbach, right? Because we had Porlock, which we did just mentioned in the last episode, as a, a, an assistant to Professor Moriarty. Hmm. And if this, if, if Billy is to have existed in Baker Street in the 1900-1903 range, then that makes it difficult, well, not, not impossible, but difficult to imagine a young boy serving over the course of uh, 10 to 15 years, shall we say? Well, there were probably just you know, triplets all named Billy, just like the Moriarty brothers, you know, were all named James. And they were all born three years apart or four years apart. And when one got to the proper age, they just assumed the responsibility. And of course, because they were all related, there was probably a lot of similarity. So he didn't need a different costume or any tailoring. It was probably very convenient. Mm. Yeah, according to um, the International Butler Academy, uh, early 20th century page boys were usually of humble uh, origin, uh, and they, they gained a place in, in a house, and they were typically apprentice footmen. Uh, and unlike the hall boys who did heavy work, these pages performed light, odd jobs and stood in attendance wearing livery when guests were being received. <laughs> yeah, the way I've always seen page boys, at least at Baker Street, portrayed, and, and of course Billy made an appearance in the William Gillette play in uh, 1899, and played early on by a young Charles Chaplin. By the way, mm. um, the way I've seen them portrayed is more like a commissionaire. They, they, they seem like if you were the the. the the, the the page boy in the liveried house, the great houses of England, seems to me to be a country kind of uh, portrayal. The city page boys seem to me to be almost like mini commissionaires uh, who are available to uh, dispatch telegrams, welcome guests, etc. Mm. Again, not heavy lifting, but um, not exactly the whole liveried outfit that you would expect out of a, a countryside guest house. Well, there's a lot going on here. I mean, one one thing is, and and you touched on it, you know, and the relationship between page boys and commissioners. Because one of the questions I had when we thought about this topic was, where do the older boys and buttons go? You know, and uh, now you can't be a commissioner without having service in a branch of the military. You that's know, right. That goes with the definition of commissioner. So it could be, you know, that uh, – but then the other thing that's going on, I mean, so let's say there were these boys in buttons and they do join the service, the Navy, the Army, and so on, and then are demobbed and become commissioners. But the other thing is why aren't they in school? You know, we have talked in the past about the Compulsory Education Act. So exactly how old – is a a boy in buttons, mm. and, you know, and and you know the other, and you're we're led to believe that it, the boy in buttons, Billy the page boy, is younger rather than older, and and we're led to believe that because of the line in Mazarin Stone, where he is described as the young but very wise and tactful page, who had helped a little to fill up the gap of loneliness an isolation which surrounded the saturnine figure of the great detective. Hmm. So that would, that would seem to imply that this is, this is a post uh, marriage scenario where Watson has moved out. Uh, Holmes is, is lonely, right? And hmm. he, you know, the, the, the page boy would have needed to have enough discretion 
you know, to be able to be helpful without being ordered about, uh, and, and, and old enough to perhaps uh, offer some kind of conversation from time to time uh, with Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you know, we all know that Sherlock Holmes loved to bounce his his ideas off of people, loved to um, you know, perhaps feed his own ego by showing off to others from time to time. And who better than a young, impressionable boy uh, to be able to, 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 to showcase this wizardry uh, that his deductions were uh, to Watson so many times. Mm. Well, one would like to think that if he held that position in the Holmes's household, that Holmes would have looked after him and that there would have been some social or educational progression for Billy the Page Boy. And for all I know, somebody's probably written a series of pastiches about William Page, who used to be the page boy in Baker Street. And I know people have written about Wiggins. Yeah. But uh, there's no connection that we know of between Billy the Page and the Baker Street Irregulars. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. That's a good point. Um and and really the irregulars are no longer on the scene when Billy makes his appearance. Let's continue on this discussion right after this quick word from our sponsor. The latest issue of the Baker Street Journal is here, and it's filled with lots of great scholarship, as usual. For example, Bruce Detman takes a look at the exploits of Sherlock Holmes. That's right, it was a book full of pastiches in an era when pastiches were rare. Brought to us by Adrian Conan Doyle and John Dixon Carr. Jim Webb takes a look at the intuition of Sherlock Holmes and where that came from. M.A.K. Duggan looks at the surplus, that is, the garment worn by Reverend Williamson in The Solitary Cyclist. Where did he get it, and where did he get his ministerial license? These and other fantastic accompanying pieces of Sherlockian scholarship wait for you in the latest issue of the Baker Street Journal. Make sure you subscribe today by going to bakerstreetirregulars.com. Okay, we're back talking about Billy the Page. Now, G.B. Newton in the Sherlock Holmes Journal in 1955, that's when this came out, uh, mentions, um, mentions that we're not certain that it was, in fact, Billy in the Valley of Fear because he, he says he's never referred to specifically as Billy. Uh, now, by no stretch of the imagination can this be the page boy of the 80s, can, can that be held to be the same person as the Billy of the 1900 to 1903 period? Nor can the page boy of 1899 be the same one as that of 1882? For later in the year, he was still only, uh, quote, a small black figure. The conclusion is inescapable, therefore, that there were at least three, if not more, page boys employed at various times at 221B. Now that that leads to, to leads to the question who who was it that actually employed the page boy would it have been Holmes himself or would it have been Mrs Hudson as part of the package deal of leasing rooms at uh, at 221B Oh well that is interesting Well as far as we know Holmes and Watson were the only tenants in the building of 221B. So it's perfectly possible that Mrs. Hudson employed a page boy to you know, run various errands and so on. It's also possible that Holmes employed him, although Holmes, you know, it's not as if Holmes has a regular residential practice, like a doctor. You know, here are my hours, and I'm here all the time. I mean, he was forever disappearing for days on end, and we've talked over the last few weeks of cases where he's absent from Baker Street for weeks at a time, pops over to France, goes here, goes there. It wouldn't be likely that he would be retaining, <laughs> you know, on his way to to uh, Paddington, he would say, oh, Watson, 
Uh, do me a favor. Send a telegram to Mrs. Hudson to tell Billy he won't be needed until next August. You know what I mean? <laughs> I can't imagine that would that would be on Holmes's radar screen, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Newton writes, he said, um, Holmes admits in the yellow face that he was badly in need of a case. And there were, of course, long, sterile periods we hear of in the early years when Holmes was driven to combat the languors of inaction by protracted chemical experiments and occasionally resorts to the cocaine bottle. If Billy's functions were confined to announcing visitors and running errands, he must have had an extremely cushy time of it. Even if he also valeted Holmes and Watson his duties, uh, or, or valeted Holmes and Watson, his duties would have hardly been onerous. On general grounds, therefore, it seems more likely that he was employed by Mrs. Hudson for general work in the house and that of any references to our, to quote, our page boy were merely avuncular. Mm. Uh, this impression is confirmed by the fact that no page boy seems to have been employed for most of the 1890s which is a period when we would expect a, a lot of activity out of, out of homes. Um, and, and there were one or two cases that were announced by Mrs. Hudson herself. For example, by the time the Bruce Partington plans came around in November of 1895. And then there was even a maid that appeared on the scene uh, who, again, would have been engaged by Mrs. Hudson and not by Holmes. And, and Newton uh, concludes, on the whole, therefore, the indications are that the page, the pages were employed by Mrs. Hudson and that their attendance on Holmes and Watson was only incidental to their general duties. I, well, yeah. I'd buy that. I'd buy that. But, you know, uh, th this notion that what happened to the Baker Street Irregulars, it very well uh, could have employed them in the later stages in um, 1900 to 1903 as his practice wound down. Uh, perhaps he used them for uh, still the street work as well as uh, page-like duties in Baker Street. Yeah, well, I think it is. I think there is a good argument to be made, or good rationale to be defined about Mrs. Hudson employing Billy the page or any other page, because after all, it's a household. You know, there are things to do. I mean, boots need to be shined, um, waste baskets need to be emptied, coal or wood for the fire needs to be moved from place to place. We've talked in the past about the lumber room where mm -hmm. seasonal furniture was stored. There'd come a time when you need to move furniture from point A to point B. Right. Uh, you need to gather sheets and things for laundry. I can't imagine Holmes saying to Watson, I say, Watson, it's Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> it's laundry day. You, um, yeah, would you mind <laughs> popping up to my room and bundling my sheets? I'm just too bad, too, yeah. too busy to do it and give them Mrs. Hudson and tell her not so much starch. <laughs> you know, that's yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's a great, uh, supposition. And, and in particular, if, if Holmes's fees, if, if his rent payments were princely, uh, we're told along the way, then Mrs. Hudson surely would have had no problem, uh, employing someone like that herself. If that's, you know, if, if we're come to understand that that's part of the arrangement. Mm. Um, the, the fundamental problem here with um, this particular paper is that nothing makes sense, no matter how you cut it. For example, um, the cases, you know, chronologically speaking, in general, the and you've told, you've mentioned this already. You know, Valley of Fear took place. Most people think 1888, Thorpe Ridge, 1900, Mazarin Stone. Now, those are the ones that Billy's mentioned by name, so just sort of staying with Billy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not likely that one person over 15 years would be, um, you know, it's impossible that it would be a very elderly page boy. That doesn't make any sense. And then if you forget about chronology and just look at publications, the page boy is mentioned in the Yellow Face, the Greek interpreter in the Naval Treaty, and those stories were published in 1893 and then, of course, Valley of Fear and published in 1915. That doesn't make any sense. There is another explanation here, of course, for Billy the Page. And, and what it, the root of it is looking at the activities of Billy. Uh, you know, the door was opened by our page boy in the yellow face. The boy fetched a four-wheeler in the Greek interpreter. The boy dispatches telegrams in the Naval Treaty. The explanation, of course, is that Watson did all these things, and he was just too embarrassed to admit it. 
<laughs> I like that. I yeah. like that. Hey, artistic license. We'll we'll give him that. Yeah. I'll give him that. Well, I did I wanted to close with one potential idea. You you mentioned earlier in the show. Uh you wondered what happened to the boys in buttons when they grew up. I think they became boys in zippers. <laughs> and that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Yes, sir.